Hello, beautiful human. I'm Zach. That's Stan. Yo. And we welcome to the studio, Steven Sanchez. Woo. Hey. Woo. He grunted uh. immediately upon entering to make it clear <laughs> that he is dominant. No, I just sat down on the couch weird, and I was trying to, I was trying to get comfy, and I just was like, ah. you know, that yeah, happens. Yeah, you have a great grunt. <laughs> Thanks. You do. Thanks. I feel like you, Good. though, declare dominance in different ways. <laughs> Here, seriously, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out. Like manliness, like like very manly energy. I Thanks, mean, man. Yeah, one, Thank like, you. you're giving, like, you're giving 1950s energy. Thank you. I don't know if that's... <laughs> that's awesome. What are you talking about? Cool. Awesome. I'm into that. I mean, that's that's the way. That's the that's the, that's the the vibe, I think. Yeah. yeah it's, it's giving good. era of a real gentleman. That's Thank what I'm trying to make. You. Thank you. Which I do I believe that. you are. That's really nice. Thank you. And I don't come to this conclusion on my own. I come to this conclusion, one, via listening to your music very deeply, but then also hearing stories of you just being a really nice person to random people in the oh. high school cafeteria. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. Whoa, that's wild that you know that. That's so good. <laughs> you were really yeah. nice to some girl who was going through a breakup. Yeah. And Whoa, you, yeah. And she told the story on TikTok. And, she did. And you just sat down with her and you gave her advice and just made it clear that the person who broke her heart didn't deserve her. Yeah, there you go. I mean, geez, I, it's like, obviously it's been a long time since I've been in high school. And so that story... I'd forgotten about it completely until that TikTok video and the and the girl who who told that story. It's so crazy to think back on that time because I didn't know anything about relationships at that time. <laughs> so it's like, cool. That's awesome. <laughs> but you were known as the guy who had the guitar. Yeah. Always. All the time. It was like a ukulele at first for for whatever reason because I just didn't know how to play guitar. And then it was and then it was guitar slowly on, which is great. So it was ukulele, and then I got upgraded. So it was good. When did you start writing music, or at least, uh, how did it start, like, writing anything? Yeah. Whoa. It's so crazy. I mean, I used to listen to independent <coughs> radio, you know, when I was growing up. And so it was just, you know, Foster the People and the band Fun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Pink and CeeLo Green were like, the first bit of music that I was listening to and cage the elephant. And, uh, and so I used to like record their songs, you know, using like my phone on the radio and stuff. So what one would do in the eighties, like with cassette tapes and all that, uh, just more technologically advanced now that we're in the modern day. But, uh, you know, I love their music and their songs and, and, you know, just a lot of that music was, you know, kind of soundtracking, those early moments of my life. And, and it got to a point where, you know, I was discovering artists and, you know, listening to vinyl for the first time and CDs and cassettes and hearing all of these different perspectives on life, you know, that were, have, have happened to these people. And I, I think it was just kind of like this realization that everybody's story isn't going to exactly align with yours. And, and so it was just this, I wasn't feeling satisfied in like some of the song you know, writing that I was hearing because I was just like, man, like this is almost me. Like hearing them tell their story, it's like almost me. And then it just kind of sparked this, like, oh, I want to tell my own stories and and my own life from my own perspective, and not have to rely on somebody else's perspective to like say who I am and like how I feel. You know, and so songwriting mm. out of that. That's so, really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Well, because it, you know, it's so weird. It goes back. We had a guest randomly on the show, Brittany Broski. Shout out! And she literally said the other day, "If the art of the world <laughs> that you need doesn't exist, you just gotta make it." Yeah. Of course, she was uh, exactly talking about a fanfic involving Harry Styles as a vampire and Robert Downey Jr. Wow. Totally different pieces of art. <laughs> <laughs> totally, to totally different pieces of art. Wow! Well, but it makes sense. Yeah, and someone needed that, and you. You needed to tell your own story because the yeah. art wasn't doing it for you exactly. fully. So you chose to do it yourself. But do you always play, I mean, some sort of instrument or does that come along with it? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I sucked for a really long time. Like it was not great. I mean, even singing and songwriting, the whole thing was terrible. Uh, and so there was no, you know, clear, this is going to work out in a great way. you know. And, uh, and so uh, I was playing ukulele and like looking it up on Google, how to play ukulele. And then, you know, guitar came from that. And I actually, I grew up in the church 
And so being a part of like a team of adept musicians that work in the church and like play gospel music every Sunday, you know, was huge for me. And it also helped inspire more of the songwriting elements because, you know, I'm watching people, you know, if we really like, you know, water it down, it's like we're watching people in a room together to celebrate something and feelings are coming out of that celebration and we're watching people impacted by music and moving and dancing to that music and so it was huge for me growing up because it was just like man like music can do that to people and you know there's an obvious like yeah like I can listen to something on the radio and like dance to it and stuff but to see someone emotionally like invested and that their life is changing because of that is is crazy to me and so um yeah it's just I mean all of it it's it's all this it's so many different things that have just made up this journey. So, uh, guitar playing from that, which is great. So you're really, guitar playing. you're really only 20 though, which is crazy young. Yeah. That's yeah, it's, wild. It's pretty wild. Yeah. But also, is it interesting to think that a lot of people out there only believe that until I found you was your first song ever? Because the reality is like, it's not like you had, yeah. you, you, you had been making music and adding like, like, decent babs like, like, like decent moments on tiktok mm -hmm. previous yeah i mean until i found you is a timeless song thank you yeah it's I appreciate gonna that. yeah it's gonna last forever oh that's beautiful <laughs> yeah, it is beautiful but it has to be scary a little bit no yeah i mean well you know i think that you know i i could care less about you know uh it's something that i say all the time where it's like you know fame fame is a beautiful thing and fortune from that is a beautiful thing uh, but it's, it's all a gift. It's nothing that's like, uh, that I feel personally that's like deserved. Like, I'm like, yes, like I deserve this position in people's lives that like someone's going to put this song on every day and they're going to create a memory with someone that they love or that they're going to remember somebody or someone's going to come to mind every time they hear that song. Like that feels like a gift and only a gift. And, and, the, and the fact that that song is going to out live me hopefully is so special for me because I don't feel that important. And if the music is more important to people than like whatever I've done and like anything like that, you know, that then that's great. Then I'm stoked on that over, over like, you know, my name being remembered and all that stuff, you know? Uh, Cause it's just, it's, it's more beautiful that way. I mean, people aren't creating memories, you know, because of Steven Sanchez, you know, they're using the music to do that. And so that's the only thing that should really matter, you know, the most, I think. Uh, I mean, even with future songs and even those past songs that we released before until I found, you know, like it was the same intention and the same heart. And even though those didn't go all the way, you know, it's still uh, it's still the hope, you know, uh, for for everything. So that's the coolest way and the most humble way and grounded way to look at it. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Do you, do you, do you start with that mindset or do you come to that mindset? Because when you're watching a song, I've, we've had so many people on our couch literally sit exactly where you are. Yeah. That come in and have, and yeah, we're talking to you after the song's been out for quite some time, but mm -hmm. it hasn't slowed down at all. It's still woven into everything. <laughs> it's still on the radio like crazy. It's still on every playlist and every yeah. grocery store everywhere. We've had so many people come on in moments where like they have a life, they they have a life changing record. Yeah. And the next move after that is like, could be some of the scariest shit ever. Yeah. <laughs> You really genuinely only care about the stories you're telling. Yeah. That, I mean, I just feel like, I just feel like it's not about me at all. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not, I mean, even when we go and play shows, I mean, the boys and I and the band, we all agree that, you know, it's like, like we get to be out playing a show and people show up for us. And that, that in itself is a gift that anyone would show up for us, you know? And I think in the same sense with the songs, you know, people are experiencing that live and, it is far less about us when we're up on stage. Like we are there. Our purpose is to soundtrack the moments in the crowd. Like everybody's story in the crowd is that it could be that they just got out of a, a breakup or, you know, someone in their family has passed away or, or, you know, uh, they're going there with someone that they love or someone that they want to love. And like, there's so many different, it's, it's like, 
it's so much more than us, you know, and it's about soundtracking those moments to help alleviate this sense of loss or this sense of, you know, wanting to be in love or to uh, help encourage, you know, somebody to share with another person that they care about them for more than a friendship, you know, it's, and so I, I feel like we've all always looked at it that way because, you know, we're all just normal dudes. I mean, we just go home after and we're just excited to see the girls that we love, you know, at home. So, <laughs> so you s- start making music because you're not feeling understood by the music that exists. Yeah. But we're, you're, you just talked about your music yeah, definitely being understood by yeah. the masses. Yeah. How crazy. So yeah. I, there is something there, right? Like, is it your story? Okay. Is it your music anymore? Is there ever, do you see like you're doing this for you or for other people? I mean, it, I mean, there's definitely like the, the realistic side of it. That's like, of course there's like an element of both. Like, I mean, there just has to be, there's this like, you know, because if I didn't love to do it, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing it, you know, at all. And I, I feel like there's, you know, the other side that's like, yeah, I mean, it's like about everyone else, you know, cause, cause at the end of the day, like I'm going to hold on to it for as long as I'm able to. I mean, we just released a song today, you know, be more just came out, you know, a, you, your I mean, range a few on, hours ago, you, like your range on it is crazy. Thank you so much. It, it was a, a crazy song to have sang. Uh, and it's, it's just like, you know, this, with songs like that, like I held on to it for so long and I'm just like, you know, this record is conceptual that we're releasing and like it's stories that I've written and I, I wrote this story to satisfy this like excitement over music because I just love music. I'm such a fan of music. But then it's like, but now it's everyone else's. I mean, people are going to create whatever they want with these songs if they so choose to, you know? And so it's kind of uh, like Rick Rubin, he was on a podcast and he was saying how like, music is essentially an act of like uh surrender like it has nothing to do with like you know if if you like it that's all that matters you know and it's like a like a service to god to like release music and to 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 give it upwards to people you know and and so uh i agree with that it feels like that in a a lot of ways yeah so yeah (laughs) it is accurate because yeah. <laughs> when you see firsthand, and every time I go to shows, and I go all the time, and I go and I get to see my friends play constantly. What's your favorite? I, I mean, I just went to go see AJR yesterday, and I saw yes. M. Uh, you know, fantastic at How's the she doing? Fair. <laughs> She's doing great. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> my favorite part about that process yeah. is watching everybody else. Like it's a show I've seen. I, I mean, I've seen AJR play dozens of times. Yeah. I've seen Ari play. I don't know, 150 times. Like not a joke. Yeah. At a certain point, I switched my focus to really feeling the energy of everybody else and the joy that is captured in this room and yeah. exists in the movements and in the eyes and in the hearts of, of literally thousands of people. And like even now, to, like this morning, I talked about it with uh, Kelsey, who's on our team, and yeah, it brings me to tears because the music is the second it's out there in the world and it's something that stems from something so personal, Mm. literally just an experience or emotion or an idea. We're going to talk about this concept album, which is fascinating where you see yourself as a character, Yeah, but like it starts literally from something so personal and ends up becoming something so much bigger, but also so deeply personal and tiny to somebody. Yeah. But if that makes any sense, it totally does. And then it comes through in these fucking concerts and you see it and how it brings people together. And it's like, you can't help but ball your eyes out. It is the craziest. I mean, I remember like when I was growing up, there was a, there's this band called need to breathe. Mm. And I was like, I mean, I just died over them. I just love their music, their songwriting. Um, And I remember going to see them at the Bob Hope theater in Stockton, California, because I used to live up North in Sacramento and uh, my mom drove me to go and see this concert. And, dude, it was like, I mean, I'd listened to music for years. And I just, like, weeped the whole show. Just seeing, like, everybody together singing the songs. And, like, everybody sharing, like, a similar experience. And it's just, like, the love for their music and their songs. And I just, it's so cool to, to get that. I mean, even just uh, a ways back, you know, seeing one of my favorite bands is Lord Huron. Mm. 
Mm. And I got to see them at a rooftop show at Pier 17 Sick. in New York. Awesome venue. And, uh, I mean, five years wanting to see them and then finally getting to and just, like, dancing around to their music with everybody else who loves their music. And I'm just like, this is so cool. Like, we're all fans of the same thing, and it's so it's so cool. I just it, love it. And it's, it's so cool. It's something, like, I don't necessarily feel like when I go to a festival. I think it's something when it's so spread out, it's harder to, like, really capture that energy you can feel yeah. it as you walk through it yeah. but when you can like turn around and look at an entire venue and it's all in your f- one field of vision oh, and yeah. you can see fucking madison square garden or yeah you know six thousand seven thousand people at a fair like it's mm. wild it's wild and uh, yeah, it's, yeah you can turn around and make a friend you just yeah, be like oh you love them too it's like yeah we're here like what <laughs> it's a beautiful yeah. thing community yeah. and music oh. Speaking of festivals, quickly, what was it like performing for like what was it two hundred thousand people with Elton John? <laughs> Nuts! <laughs> That's a sea of people. Man, it was the it was the shittiest experience. No, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, man, it was the it was. I mean, I remember that morning. I, I woke up and uh, I have someone very special in my life, and I, I called them, and I was just like freaking out about it because obviously there was so much build up to it, and you know. Him and I uh, have had interactions, Elton and I, you know, over a long period of time. And so it was just this like, okay, now we're doing this thing. And it's like, it's it's happening. And, you know, there was months behind it and then it turned into weeks behind it. And then there was days and it was just like, like, this is actually going to be a thing. And so that morning, you know, I'm waking up and it's like, okay, we're actually going to go. I'm actually going to be there. And it's very scary. And, uh, I just cried all my fear out. I was so scared and I was just, cause it's just like, I, I just, I do feel like such a fan to all this, like all the time. Like I don't feel like famous or like I'm the shit or anything like that. I just feel like such a, like, okay, let's, let's go to work and do, do the thing. And like, I'll be Steven Sanchez for today. And then I'm going to go home and like, you know, order pizza, you know, kind of thing. And like, be like very, normal and like everybody who comes up and like loves the music it feels very normal and so I was just having this kind of like mid mid life without being in the middle of my life kind of like holy shit like this is like a really big deal and I don't feel like you know I fit the imposter syndrome yeah totally I mean immediately that and so you know and then the rest of the day you know just walking around and you know um you know uh and I feel super normal in in like environments like that too because I just feel like you know, I assume everybody feels that way because I feel very normal that I like, you know, Slash is walking around and like Dave Grohl and I'm just like, they have to feel just like normal, you know, walking around. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to be like normal too, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so like we're, they're, they're walking around and, you know, uh, Kate Hudson's there. I'm like, that's cool. Watch, you know, Almost Famous on the Plane, like, you know, <laughs> over here. And uh, it was just so cool. And there was so much build up to it and so much, you know, glamour to it. And it's just like... You know, I'm going to use the the bathroom and like I'm my my uh, green room is next to Elton John's and like across from Brandon Flowers and Rena Sawayama's dressing room and I'm I'm using the bathroom and Brandon Flowers is like practicing and like warming up and I'm just like I'm just having a pee and just like he's singing <laughs> and that's so so weird you know and there was just all these crazy beautiful moments that were leading up to that and then you know when we finally came down to playing on the stage you know. Uh, we're we're getting there and everyone's wrapped around the TV in the green room, you know, and there's Dave Grohl's watching and everybody's watching. And I, I go up, you know, onto the side stage and I'm back there and I'm like getting pumped up, getting ready to go. And I just felt like fearless, man. Like yeah. I just felt like I could, I could split the sky in half with how fearless I felt. Like I was just, you know, we walked out there and, and the only way to actually get onto the stage from like where you are is to get out onto the stage and then go to the side. And so I was on the side. So I got to see the crowd and sit there and look at them for a second. And it was like, I mean, I'm getting like the nervous energy again, like thinking about it. Like it was so massive and wild. It was like, I've never seen that many people in one place. And, And you could look back as far as it would go and there would still be more people. And they called my name and I just like, you know, that was it. I just felt infinite in that moment just infinite like I could do anything you know and um get and getting to honor him too I mean he he emphasized he was like take advantage of the stage like don't like 
don't waste it. Like this is the craziest thing ever at this point in your life. Like just take advantage of it. And so I get to honor him and like say, say a kindness that, you know, to him and recognize that. And it was just, it was surreal, man. It was surreal. And and the guys in the band are, are wonderful, you know, and they've had a, an amazing career. And, um, I mean, Elton's wonderful, you know, and it's just so cool. <laughs> so cool. What do you think someone like Sir Elton John hears in your music that makes him want to invite you to be a part of this? Oh, man. I mean, I can only speak from, like, what he's told me. I mean, you know, I, I think it's just that, you know, I mean, Elton obviously grew up with, you know, the rock and roll, you know, like the early, like, you know, he grew up on Elvis and, you know, the miracles and Smokey Robinson and, you know, I mean, he, the temptations and like, I can attest to that just in the fact that we were at, you know, the music cares event together, sitting next to each other and the temptations came out to sing my girl. And he was literally turning to me, like singing the song to me. And I was just like, <laughs> I guess you say, and he's like singing it back. I'm like, this is so weird. Like we just met tonight and now we're singing together, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and so he's just, he's such a fan of music, man. And I, I think that's why he's just, I mean, he's so ingrained in like new artists. Cause he's just, he wants to champion that music. And I, I think for me, it's just like, I think he recognizes that, you know, there's a deep love for music as well and just such a fan to it and a fan of music that he grew up with and you know that I'm influenced by obviously with until I found you I mean there's I mean it's it's all Steven Sanchez but you know Elvis and Roy Orbison like played a role in the fact that that song exists because you know I wouldn't know how to create anything like that without them and and so I think there's a recognition of that just in in him hearing that and like Evangeline and you know Only Girl there's you know Motown and Evangeline and Only Girl's got that you know jump to it and so uh yeah I don't know I can't I can hardly believe it to be honest so long-winded but there you go <laughs> yeah when you started actually making records in a serious manner did you yeah. go because on the EP and we're gonna talk about the album yeah uh, th there's a bunch of like really heavy nostalgic sounding records like very you know yeah. You just passed. Amazing. Very present at the same time. Like, the right balance. Thanks, but man. then there's more, like, Cage the Elephant and, like, Foster the People. More, like, alt-folky records on there, yeah, too. Totally. Do you start making music at the gate with a vintage air to it or vintage feel to it? And and the answer is, uh, the, the other question is why? Mm. I'd probably say no, because, like... I mean, until I found you, it was kind of like an accident in a way. <laughs> like it just felt intrinsic and it just kind of came out one day. And obviously with this new record, it's like kind of pressing that vein like very heavily because, you know, it was just, I felt like for a long time actually that I was, I wasn't making exactly like it felt like I was making the music that I was supposed to make at the time, you know, obviously, because, you know, there's your, I mean, I was 17 when I got signed and then started making my first record when I was 18, never been in a studio. And then, you know, being signed to a major label, there's so much like expectation that's kind of perceived, you know, just right out of the gate, just from somebody who's never been in the business before. And so for me, it was just kind of like, I felt like I was making what I thought people would want to hear initially while also being like, but I'm going to say what I want to say. You know, and now it's been like, you know, obviously because the first records were very singer songwriter and folky and now it's completely in that 50s and 60s style. Like now it just feels like I'm just making music that I love because those influences were just all that I listened to growing up. You know, like as much as I listened to Foster the People and Cage the Elephant, you know, and singer songwriters, like they weren't like the the main, you know thing like my main squeeze like it was always Roy Orbison and Elvis and the Platters and Frank Sinatra and these big band you know voices that you know are entirely timeless like within our generation I mean so I think when it came to actually you know making a record that felt retro it wasn't like initially a first like muscle memory like I'm gonna do this like thinking about it like it was just kind of like this just exists because like it exists in me and it feels intrinsic and it feels like me, you know? And, uh, and so when, until I found you came out, I was just like, okay, like we could do that, you know? And, and then Evangeline came out and I was like, okay, we could really do that. And then it was like, 
oh, let's make a record, you know. But that's the shift of doing music that you think people want to hear and doing music that you want to hear, right? Yeah. And, like, and at the end of the day, like, your stories have remained honest throughout all of it. But what, yeah. where does Until I Found You genuinely come from? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's like a, it's crazy because, like, obviously the story of that song is is real. You know, we've we've made it so it fits within this, you know, story of this this conceptual record and so like the the actual person that the song is written about is now a character in this story but in reality in in life you know this song was written about a girlfriend that I was you know dating you know and someone that you know was important to me in my life when I was you know in some of like some some very like you know life building moments you know and and you know, lots of change happening and, and she was there for a lot of that. And, you know, I wrote the song about her and our relationship and I, uh, you know, yeah, it was, you know, and it's funny too, cause it wasn't like a love song. It was kind of like a, I messed up kind of song in a way. Uh, cause I was going through a hard time with my folks at home and, uh, I was feeling uh, a bit, um, and embarrassed in a way like not embarrassed just like not feeling like comfortable enough to bring her into that where it was at the time and so I pushed her away and then I felt unworthy just in my own sense to you know be with that person and so the song is literally about you know re requiting that and like apologizing for that and like being like I, I couldn't be without you kind of thing and uh and yeah, and obviously like the song for me now is a lot different than what it was, you know, when I was 18. That's what that song was to me. It was about a girlfriend and now it's so much more than that. You know, it's so much more than that. It's about everybody's love story and, you know, realizing that you, you know, kind of find more of yourself in finding somebody else, you know, to be a part of that. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Why were you afraid to tell the person you cared this much about about the problems you were facing with your family? Uh, you know, man, it was just, I mean, how do you do that? Like, how do you, how, how do you, how do you meet somebody and just like look at them and see all the, all the mess of yourself and, and have that be the first thing right out of the gate, you know, cause, cause you kind of expect, you know, sometimes in a relationship to have that buffer room to kind of be like, Oh, like, let me give you the best of myself. And all I had at the time was the worst of myself, trying to be the best of myself. And and that's hard. And so it was just kind of like this intimidating thing that I wasn't really ready for. And, uh, you know, and yeah, and I, I wish that person just the absolute best now at this point because it's just like, you know, it's... So it never even, like... No, we never got... I mean, we broke up after the song was released. <laughs> so it's like... or this, We broke up before the song released... And, uh, and then it was out and then it was like, I had to advertise that song, you know, forever. And then it became humongous forever. <laughs> it was like this really weird, like, okay, you get to get over this relationship in a crazy way. And, uh, but it also, you know, it, it, I made a lot of mistakes, you know, after that. And I think it, I'm really grateful for that time. Cause you know, uh, yeah, because, I mean, so much life happened after that. And, you know, having a huge song happen and then your career goes and someone you care about goes and, like, lots of, like, new things entering and lots of things exiting your life. And so I, I'm very grateful for that time in the sense I feel like it's it's helped me to, um, you know, recognize that, you know, it's okay for things that are meant to stay, to stay. It's okay to let go of things. It's okay to allow new things to come into your life, and oh. um, and now like that song is so much more than that. And I don't, I don't know that I see it that way. And I, I definitely don't want to advertise it that way. That it is about you know an ex girlfriend as much as it is. You know, it's, I mean, looking at it now, it's it's so much it's so much bigger than that now. And I'm oh, I'm really yeah. grateful for that. You know, in a way. Um, so yeah. And, and she's great. And, you know, she's living her life. And I'm so stoked for her and all that she's doing. So, yeah. How rich has that song made you? <laughs> I don't know. 
You don't, I don't know. I don't know, what man. A life mean, when you don't need to look. I got to recoup stuff. So, I mean, uh, <laughs> 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 enough. I mean, it's, it's enough. It's, it's open doors to uh, oh, it's make. Changed your life. Yeah. I mean, I, I bought my first house. Oh. So that was cool. Uh, I'm not even, I'm like renting it out now. Uh, so you moved to another place. I'm moving to New York. <laughs> so, Wow. I'm a man with multiple listings. It's just, well, I'm renting that. So <laughs> it'll be, uh, it'll be good. It'll be all right. <laughs> the song took you to Sophia Richie's wedding. It did. How crazy She's is lovely. that? She's so great. Wow. That it was well too. It was a star, star studded time. Uh, it was cool. It was cool. I mean, it's kind of. It's weird to think about because it's like I again like it's so like I can recognize them as like for for the impact in like culture that they have had with their fame and like you know with Lionel Richie and you know like uh, Cameron Diaz was there I'm like yes I've seen your movies but like you're so normal and like we're just here at a wedding and we're celebrating love and that's so cool like that's so cool and uh gosh I mean it was such a cool favor to have gotten to be a part of that wedding. I mean, I would Wait, have done hold it. hold on. Favor? What are you talking about? It was like, well, okay. So like, uh, yeah, how much did I pay? 50 grand? Plus no, 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 no. It wasn't a, it wasn't a paid <laughs> thing or anything like that. It was a, uh, and I, I would have done it for free. I would not have, would not have gotten paid for that. Would not accept payment for that. Like any moment to celebrate some loving. That's good. That's good. That's good jam. That's I'll keep that in mind. That's good jam. Uh, and obviously the context is a beautiful thing, you know? And so, uh, you're not Lionel Richie. You're not Lionel Richie. So, uh, so <laughs> her husband, uh, her husband, he, he had asked, um, cause, cause his dad, you know, he, he works in the business is a huge Hello? name in business, uh, Lucian Grange. And so, <laughs> and so, and so he, his son knew that, uh, so Sophia loved until I found you and like was playing a lot. And so he, he asked his dad if, if that was possible. And so. He the way, that's me. like that's your boss's boss's boss. <laughs> yeah. So so the the, the main man who is the, the loveliest man. man ever, a great great father, great man, uh, and an icon, and one of the smartest businessmen in music to ever exist, hands down. He, you said it, I Sir mean, Lucian Grange. He like you bad to the guy. Yeah, I mean he. Uh, so he reached out to us and he <laughs> he asked a favor. He was like, "Would you would you come and be part of?" The wedding, would you come and sing the song? And I was like, done, of course. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And so uh, he flew us out uh, to Nice, and then we were there for, I mean, two days. We were there for two days and uh, sang the song. And uh, I remember um, Elliot went down to go meet uh, Sophia down down the aisle, and uh, he's like, do you do you uh, do you see who's over my shoulder singing the song? And she was like, oh, I, I don't know. And uh, she looked over her shoulder, and it was it was me singing the song. And obviously, we replaced Georgia with Sophia, and uh, which was asked for, which was a great idea. And uh, she just lost it, and so she she was there for a while. And so we kept having to sing like the chorus over and over again because she was crying, you know. And so she was having to like get ready, you know. And she was having like a wardrobe malfunction because like she was crying over that moment. And uh, you know, we got to dance together at the at the after party, and you just it was just so great. And I was so honored to have been part of her special day and she's just the sweetest loveliest woman and and elliot's so great and we smoke cigars and you know it was it was great sick it was great it's a beautiful beautiful wedding so i was grateful for that what a life so 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 fun <laughs> are you are you looking for the next like when you're releasing this album angel face are you looking for the next song that's going to have that impact i mean sure but you know i don't think it's up to me really you know in a way i mean it's like I can only do so much, and obviously TikTok is such a huge like free marketing <laughs> app in a way. You know that's full of songwriters and and singers and dancers and photographers and videographers, and I mean, there's so much content to consume at one time that it's like it's almost intimidating to feel like at this point now, like with where it's at, you know that songs can kind of get through but I, I i think it it becomes about people loving a song and and wanting that so it's almost in a way it's almost back to 
the time where radio was so important and, and it is still, but I mean, God, like such, like that was the way that songs like went all the way. And, and it almost feels like TikTok's like radio in a way. Cause I mean, it's such a mass consumption that is happening at, all at once that it's like, it's kind of up to everybody, you know? as as it's heard to make that song what it is but then also there's people who are part of the team at the label and at, at radio who help to make those songs shine through in those moments and so gosh i mean we're we're always trying but i mean it's just it's up to everybody else you know and uh, you know we always work hard and i mean there's so many people who've spent late nights and early mornings for me and i'm so grateful to them uh and uh yeah who knows who knows be more could be it it mm-hmm. could be another song. It could have been a song that's already out and like True. it could just pop Resurface, off. Resurface, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, Dude. think of like uh, like the Walters, you know, they, they had that huge song, I Love You So, but I was listening to that song in the eighth grade, you know, and like I loved that song and it wasn't huge at the time and now it's like huge. I mean, it's almost got a billion streams on it, you know, like, uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's just crazy how songs can kind of just do that, you know at any point now it's so cool it is wild the democratization of a medium is pretty crazy but also in the same breath like to your point it's harder for somebody to break through yeah right and at the end of the day nobody controls the algorithm except for the company that owns the code that really controls the algorithm i guess so man and it's out of so many people's hands and if we ever think that like that is truly something that is like natural that doesn't have human interference you're, that's not. It's, I, mean, it's, uh, I mean, Kate Bush. Come on, right. like that song mm-hmm. came out in the eighties. Like, okay. running up that hill wasn't. Well, a, that was in a, the eighties. Like that was, that was a sink that, dis- like, shaped culture, and then it went on to go do its own thing. So yeah. that's yet a hundred percent. I mean, just I mean, but think about how many sinks there are, and then like how many get fall by the wayside. Like, oh, t- yeah. Like, and then people took that song. But that's that's the merit like, of the record, right? Oh my god, it's that, just crazy. You can, is it like a focus camp? Like I don't know, like. Lizzo, Truth Hurts was the same thing, right? That was another Netflix sync that popped off years later. Um, by the way, Hey There, Delilah pops off years later. If we go all the way back in time, courtesy yeah. of the Plain White Tees, there's so many records that pop off way later in life. Uh, I love that. Label Me, AJR, World's Smallest Violin, fucking middle of the album record mm-hmm. that is now their most streamed song as of the last, like, four months. Whoop, whoop. It's crazy. All well done, boys. TikTok. Well done. Didn't Miley just release like her new album, but then a song from the Plastic Hearts album took off yeah. right around the same time? Yeah. Like, yeah, it like, was uh, Angel like Angels. You or, like, you or, like Angel Like You or something? Yeah. It's like you put That's out a new so album. Crazy. You're like, now we're going to go back to this album. Yeah. Like, it, it is like, okay, the algorithm, yes, is somebody owns it, but ultimately the people do have a hand in like what gets fed into it, right? Look, dude, music culture right now is fucking crazy yeah, cool right now it is so cool because like i mean like listen like we have we got music from all i mean every every side of the we got stuff in the 80s 50s like like you know popping off like you know like remixes of songs you know songs that came out last year that are now popping off this year songs that came out five years ago like and it's all because like people are returning back to that and there's just so it's just so cool that like anything is like possible with that now it's just so fun it's so exciting but it's less predictable than ever before because to your point like you you mentioned like a bunch of different pillars of like what it takes to get a record off the ground yeah now the record just needs to get lifted off the ground organically before anybody chooses to carry it all the way or even see it a quarter of the way exactly whereas before and musicians will tell you you know kylie minogue's coming in later which i'm really excited for when you know back like when she was making music or really up until a few years ago there was like a strategy on how to break a record. Yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? Like you knew exactly who to talk to. Like you knew who's like palms to grease or like who to yeah. kind of like wine and dine and jerk. Yeah. Now, nah, fuck that. Like it's like, yeah, it's up to the people. Can't like, jerk anybody. No. <laughs> no. Well, for so many reasons. <laughs> for so many reasons. No more wine and dining. <laughs> this album, Angel Face. Yeah. Is you, but you... Like, you're watching yourself? Yeah. This is about a character. A, a character tour is the wrong way to describe it, but, like, mm-hmm. it's about you, but not about you. Can you explain it? Yeah, of course. I mean, it is essentially if Steven Sanchez's career was set in the years 1958 through 1964, and he was killed by the mob because he stole a mobster's girl. Oh. 
Uh, you know, like it is <laughs> entirely this. this. I mean, I, I feel it's exciting for me because, uh, you know, I like feeling like I'm on the outside of it so I can be excited about it too. And so it's not like all about like, yeah. like, you know, it, I, I think actually like Killian Murphy said it like best in a recent interview he did for like the Oppenheimer movie. He was like, like I, I hate talking about myself, but like I love talking about like the work and I feel that way like with this because it's like it's it is me. It's like a character, but it's like not me, you know, like I can uh, separate the two and like talk about this thing as that. And uh, so essentially like, you know, the, the troubadour Sanchez starts out as Steven Sanchez in the moon crest back in 1958 after until I found you explodes from their television performance on the Connie Co show uh, in Los Angeles. And, uh, and then from there, like, you know, it's Steven Sanchez and the Mooncrest and they're releasing singles and it's hit after hit. And it's all about this voice of this young crooner back in the day. And then, uh, you know, they get signed to Mercury records, you know, into the fifties and then onto the sixties and they're releasing more and more music. And then he becomes the troubadour Sanchez, you know, after his career is spanning all these years and people are falling in love with this music and this time. And, and, uh, he leaves Los Angeles, you know, and is, is on the road and all this stuff. And, and upon returning to Los Angeles, he is doing a residency at the Angel Club that is owned by this gang called Hunter and the Mad Mob uh, back in the 60s. And, uh, and so they own the club and Evangeline is the love interest. And that is Hunter's girl, the main guy in that gang. And uh, Evangeline and I meet at this club because I'm staying at the hotel down the way. And uh, I meet her at the bar in the club. And uh, we end up falling in love for real. And uh, Evangeline's with him out of, you know, just a longing for the real thing. And then she finds the real thing with the troubadour. And so they're romancing in secret and he's singing all these songs for her. And a lot of the record is just dialogue, you know, you know, and it's... Uh, wanting her to be more and it's you know it's saying you know you know there's songs like hi that's like i'm gonna get you so high and like saying that he's gonna steal her from hunter and like you know saying you know it doesn't do me any good for you to say you want to love me but then not you know and so there's so much you know dialogue happening in the form of songs and uh and uh eventually hunter finds out you know that i've stolen his girl and the first residency show uh the goons rush the stage and I knock out all three of them. And then right before I land the final blow to, you know, that no good Hunter, he, uh, whips out a revolver and sinks a bullet in my chest. And then, and then that's it. And, uh, and that's the whole story. It's just this love and this loss and life and death and, you know, and it's, a lot of humanizing these characters that are, you know, it's giving them personality. Like the true world is extremely, you know, aware of what's happening, but he's choosing to be naive. And, you know, uh, Evangeline is blinded by her love that and fearful over her love. And there's just so much to humanity to these characters that I feel like can be uh, felt by fans, you know, without being gunned down, but maybe that their love is stolen from somebody or that, you know, they would do anything for somebody. Maybe it's that they're just like... Or choosing to be naive will make you dead. Exactly, maybe, or, or it'll make you heartbroken, you know, if you don't want to go the extra mile of being killed. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so uh, it's a beautiful thing, to, and it's so exciting for me, because it's just like, oh, it's just a story, and I get to like build out these characters and act as this guy, you know, and when we do the live shows in the fall, it's like, we're all dead. Like the moon crests on stage, you know, the boys in the band, they're the moon crests and I'm the troubadour, but we're all dead. Like we're all haunting these venues, you know, and we're still <laughs> caught in this sick. never ending, like tale of woe sharing the story. And so we're playing the record front to back, you know, as go ghosts. And, uh, it's, uh, it's really exciting for us. And so there's going to be dialogue, you know, like when we're introducing like, like hi, like ladies and gentlemen, this song we wrote back in the day, we want to dedicate it to that no good son of a bitch hunter who stole our girl from us. And then this song's called High. And then we just go into it. And so there's like, it's going to be like a bit the whole time for fans just to get more ingrained in it. So uh, what, uh, is, what is the process like here? Does it cool. start with the story or does it start with the songs and then you attach the story to it? 
Uh, honestly, the the story did not exist until Trent Dabbs and Nick Global and I wrote Evangeline, you know, with the Bobby Goldsboro, you know, uh, sample, Honey, you know, and uh, without that song, this album would not exist, I think, it, because it opened, one, the door that an album like this could exist from myself, and two, it also enabled me to just press on that vein of loving that music for so long and and then actually getting the opportunity to be able to create it and then we started writing songs it was just like okay like how do we make this more than just like a record because everybody's releasing a record this year and and what what makes any of them different you know other than the fact that it's either a well-established artist who has a fan base and they're gonna have fans who are gonna listen to this record no matter what but what about the new artists that are coming in and are trying to establish themselves? Like what makes that different from so-and-so who's trying to, you know, make a name for themselves. And, and so when it came down to it, it was just like, okay, let's make like a story like that people can get behind and like feel like they can stand in the shoes of so that it's far less about, you know, the artist, Steven Sanchez. And it's far more about the record, you know, and the angel face and, you know, Evangeline and the Troubadour and Hunter and all these different sides and the the humanity of it and uh, and so I think it just kind of unfolded you know as soon as these songs were being written you know it just slowly became this thing because as we started writing it it was just like this is a this is something I'm saying to Evangeline and like and then the Troubadour came as we were writing the record and then, you know, the angel club came as we were writing the record and then me dying came after, you know, Ben Schneider and I from Lord Huron and I wrote Caught in a Blue and like uh, No One Knows and Death of the Troubadour, you know, and started to make it more devastating because he's obsessed with this idea of like not everything is so pretty and he kind of like helped me in a huge way because he was like, I've heard the record and it's so loving, but you know, there's no, there's nothing devastating about it and that's not realistic. And I was just like, oh, you're so right. So like, I have to die. I should die in this record. That's that's so dramatic and devastating. And so, uh, yeah, it all just kind of unfolded because of the people that I've gotten to work with and this team and the support of this story. You know, I just wouldn't exist without everybody who's been involved, you know, outside of just myself. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's really exciting. So, it, I, uh, <laughs> Is this going to be how you do your albums moving forward, which is just a different character version of yourself in different situations i have no idea i have no idea this was like a I felt like the best happy accident ever and i have no idea how it'll look when it comes to making the next thing it's really exciting for me i mean i love i didn't think i'd love telling stories so much you know from characters and and i really do so i think that i'm just gonna kind of ride that and chase that feeling for a while because it feels good and you're writing you're writing as a as a character but it is still somewhat attached to your reality and your truth yeah totally i mean the only song that is actually about somebody on the record is something about her like that is the only song in in reality that is about somebody really uh yeah but we'll just leave it at that because <laughs> uh yeah but it's uh it's so special you know and and it Actually, I'm glad there's just one because I'm just like, ah, oh, like I got that one, but the rest is just characters, you know? By the way, you can listen to all of Steven Sanchez's music. It's waiting for you on Amazon Music. What are you thinking, Daniel? Well, be more. That's out now. And that high note is crazy and it's long. Wow. Thank you so much. Is it is it easy to sing that? Does that come natural? It was, man, it was like 10.30 p.m. in the studio and we didn't have that initially. And, uh... I remember that day, that was the first song we wrote for the re for the new record. And uh, it set the stage for the rest of this record and everything. And um, I remember I just worked my ass off on that song. Cause, and it's funny too, I just, like, I was a month out of having vocal surgery. Yeah, you had a polyp. You had a polyp and I had vocal surgery. And so I spent months not being able to sing, write, do anything. Because I just couldn't sing and play. So I couldn't write. And, uh, and then when we started to write the record this was the first time that I was singing like at all. Like, and so, you know, we got in, it was super intimidating for me for that to be like a ballad, like a really hearty ballad. And, uh, man, it just, it was just such a, I mean, it's so emotional for me because it's just like that song is so special. And, 
that high note is so crazy because it was so late at night and I was exhausted and I was just like, let me try this thing. And we maybe did that like 10 times over and, uh, and it wasn't like that before. And then the last one, which is the one that is on the record, um, I, I did it and then I left. I didn't know if it was good or not. And then I came back in the next morning and he sat me down. He's like, dude, this is like, it's religious. Like, this is like, this is something spiritual, like this crazy note. And uh, I just felt like so of the time too. I mean, people were doing like the shit. You know, and just like super high Frankie Valley stuff. And uh, it was just fun to get to do that. So it's crazy. <laughs> Your vocals are crazy. They're Thank wild. They're really superb. How do you realize you can sing? Oh, God. I mean, we're here. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know that there was a point where I was like, I can sing. I think it was like, you know, when. I think in moments like that, I'm I'm reminded again because there's definitely moments where I'm like, oh shit, I don't know if I can, I don't know, man, can I sing? I don't know. And then uh, we have moments like be more, and I'm like, nah, I can sing. It's cool, <laughs> you know, we're good. And uh, or I'll write something that I really believe in and be able to sing it, and someone like feels emotional from it, and I'm just like, cool, like it's great, you know. Do you channel something when you sing, or are you just going solely as yourself? I think it's become more theatrical now, you know, with the, you know, the 60s, 50s flair to it. But I think, like, if I've written a song about somebody, you know, and it feels very fresh, like something about her is about somebody that I just, I mean, that feels like the first love song I've ever written. It just feels like... Really? Yeah. I mean, it just, it's like so, so special to me. And the person I wrote for is so special to me. And, you know, I think it's like, um, you know, it's just different now. I think it's just, you know, when, when writing something that feels like that, you know, I think I go somewhere with that, you know? And, uh, I think with the other songs on the record, it's kind of, I'm channeling that, you know, you know, charismatic, like, you know, troubadour vibe, you know, that, and what I would, think that how I think he would perform them you know and how he'd perform those songs and you know uh so definitely I think so definitely there's a lot more movement a lot more hip gyrating and shake shake yeah you got a Johnny B. Good moment didn't you hey there you go come on yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah shake man shake god what how a fun is that? what an on the nose song <laughs> we were all kind of racking our brains like should we put this on there because it's pretty like on the nose but I was like yes like it's perfect like there's no, nobody's doing that right now. No. Who's doing that right now? Nobody. We got to do that. You know, it's fun. Um, and if it feels good, I mean, yeah, if it feels good, then it's great. Song definitely feels good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Did you, you oh, go ahead. You go. Do you, do you use any of the techniques that they used back in like the 50s or 60s to make these? Because it, it doesn't sound like it was made today. Oh, thanks, man. I yeah. appreciate that. I mean, we try to do things in like full full takes you know as they would do and like we try to record everything pretty together like pianos and guitars and drums and guitars and like make it feel very organic and live um but even i think the biggest thing was you know when we were recording like any sort of background vocals it was we were all rapping around a mic together you know for be more when it's like be more like, be more you know with the little glockenspiel you know thing it, it's uh all of that was happening at the same time. And, you know, so it felt like there was a relationship there. And so it feels like everything has a relationship and nothing is separate from each other. So, uh, definitely, definitely did some of the old ways of doing it. Um, I think, or just how we thought they would now, you know, I mean, if somebody popped out of a time machine and was like, all right, let's make music now. And I know how to use all this stuff. How would I do it? And it's like, Oh, like this, you know, I think, uh, so maybe, maybe it's like this. Maybe it would be this way. Who knows? It's Can really you guys hear my belly gargling in this? Can you guys hear that? No, you'll be okay. You can't? Mom, I think I'm so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, go listen to Steven Sanchez's music. It's all waiting for you. Uh, Angel Face isn't coming though until September. Yeah. What a bummer. Are you going to be releasing more songs until then, yeah? I think so. I think we got, well, we got one more. 
I think we got one more. Two, we're more. Getting, we're getting two more. more. One more, two more. Why not? I mean, this is such a fun record. I mean, 13 songs. Lucky number 13. Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, we just want to... I think the biggest goal is to invite people into this story, into this space. You know, like, we want to give something to the world that, you know, artists really aren't right now. You know, not that I'm doing... Not that I have some, like, higher... Thing and I've got some better record than everybody else, but there is something to be said that there there isn't something happening like this right now, totally. and it feels very special. And so inviting people into that uh, with as as many songs as possible feels exciting and it feels special. And I think we want to keep doing that, you know, until that song comes out and like, or until this full thing comes out, so that people feel like they are a part of this story and feel like when they do sit down and listen to the whole thing, that if they do just want to jump around, they can and it feels like they still understand, you know, this, this world and, you know, there's a freedom to do that. But then also if people want to listen top to bottom, they can do that too. And it's like, there's going to be no, no one's going to miss it, you know? And so, uh, it's going to be really exciting to to see that. I'm I'm excited to see the show. Mm -hmm. Thanks, man. It's going to be cool. It'll be really, it's going to be really special. It's going to feel like you're stepping out of a time machine. And we, the boys and I might just ask fans to like dress up like they're from that period Sick. just to make it. People love that. All the more. Because why not? You know yeah, I mean? Fun. I mean, it's so fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really sick. Thank you. By the way, your tattoos are amazing. Thanks, man. The hearts on your fingers are pretty cool. That's awesome. Little, little hearts. When did you there? get them? I got them right when I turned 18. Like right away. Like I, uh. I got this, uh, this like hand. I don't know if you can see this. Oh, that's Ooh. cool too. It's like a little hand, uh, and uh, I got that first. And then the next week, I went and like got my whole arm done, and my dad was just like freaking out because <laughs> it was like it went from one tattoo to like my fingers now and my hand and like, <laughs> I mean, I got tattoos on my body and I got a heart on my chest and like a panther and like all sorts of. Hey, you have a panther on your groin. I, a, a groin? Oh no! It's a it's a it's a lady. It's a little cowboy lady. Oh, you. Cow- but it's like on my side. It's not really like in my. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's like on the side. We know you. Oh, you have a panther on your torso. Torso. There you go. That's the word. A lady on your groin, <laughs> panther on your torso. Oh, like on the side, like my like lower stomach. I feel like less groin because groin is like in there. It's in the, in in it. Yeah. You know. Right, I mean, oh, yeah. you you don't you don't say like I got kicked in the groin and then and then point to your side. You're like, I no, know. I got kicked yeah. in the the dong. The dong. Oh, I don't know anatomy. You, Why do you get a panther on your torso? <laughs> you don't know anatomy. No. You don't could know you it? name Could you name a muscle? Shit. Could what? you name a muscle or like two? <laughs> I'm thinking about it right now. What are, what are these called? Traps. Amazing. See, I there got, you go. I Everyone, give. He's done it. Right, He's done it. This is it. <laughs> He had one job and he accomplished. Yeah. It was great. So I would assume you knew the groin. Yeah. I don't think, is that a muscle? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just an area, right? You yeah. can pull a groin. I don't know. I don't know. This is crazy that we are. This is awesome. But you have a panther on your torso. What torso. does that mean? Uh, are you the panther? <laughs> am I the panther? I'm honestly, I'm just a, just a fellow with tattoos, man. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just a, I just like it. I don't know. I, there's not like a, uh, there's nothing like deep rooted in it. Like I feel, I feel confident with tattoos. It makes me feel very confident. Like if, uh, like honestly, just uh, I'm I'm not like a super like jacked guy, and so tattoos uh, and, make up for it. I guess so in a way. I mean, not really either. I just like, I just like the art. It just makes me feel confident. Like it kind of makes up for like the area of like. You know, that, you know, being super muscular might, you know, make you feel more confident. Like, tattoos kind of can take a place of that. Like, you can, you know, feel confident from that. Like, it's a thing on your body that makes you feel confident about your appearance. And so, I feel confident with them, I think. That's it. Well, they're beautiful works of art. Mm -hmm. Thanks, man. You're you're a beautiful work of art. Well, we have no time for lies anymore. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for lying. Uh, Steven Sanchez, his music is waiting for you. Yeah. Uh, link in the description below. Old people love you. <laughs> the geriatric crowd's a big deal. Yeah. Uh, uh, somebody writes, I'm 76 years old and I love his music. It takes me back to when songs were stories and not a lot of noise. Oh. Wow. 
His music and lyrics are so beautiful and soulful. My favorite being Evangeline. I like them all, but that one is my favorite. That is from Patricia Lloyd Dillon. Sounds like a 76-year-old name. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it sounds like it's been around for a while. (laughs) Wow. Why do you think old people like you? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. I got, like, pinchable cheeks or something. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's... uh, You bring them back to yesteryear? Maybe the yesteryears of their their days. (laughs) You know, I I don't know. I don't know why anybody likes me. I I feel like... uh, yeah, I mean, I'm nice. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I'd be nice to them if I met them. That's, uh, that's really, that's 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 nice. Yeah, it's nice. You know, it's nice. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I can't really explain why, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I dress nice, I smell good. You know, I got a, a nice face. Maybe a, maybe it's a face that feels uh, um, uh, welcoming. To a 76-year-old. Your energy just takes them back to the sock hops. Or... Maybe. The sock hops. Wow. The sock hops. You know, yeah. Takes them back to the the diner or something. The diner, the days. I maybe mean, even not the diner. Maybe just like chilling in their room, putting a record on, like smoking yes. a little or something like that. Who knows? Like everyone's got such a crazy story with all that. It's cool. I don't know. Is it's... it weird to wrap your mind around? Like is that like hard, like almost uncomfortable for you to think about how many people have actually heard your music? I think it's so cool. Like, I just remember when no one was listening and it was such a weird hustle. <laughs> it was just kind of like a, like, I mean, I used to set up shop like in my high school cafeteria, like playing songs, borderline harassing people to listen to <laughs> what I wrote that week and uh, would do that the entire 30 minute lunch period. So I'm sure people loved you. Everyone was at the mercy of like the bell to save them from that. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, it's cool because it's just like, People who grew up listening to that music, I feel like, are able to connect with this because of a sense of nostalgia. People who are my age who just love that music are able to just connect because they love that music. And then people who have never heard that music. It's a fresh way to tell a story. It's like fresh to them, which is, it's like so sick. It's so sick. And so it's just like, I don't know. I think, yeah, it's just, it's cool. It's nice having old people like my music and not even old, like nicely like aged like fine wine like they're like yeah, those fine wine folks yeah that's how you like call them you call wine. them wise they call them wise yeah the nice way to call uh, like what do you what's the nicest way to call somebody old i old. mean i call it fine wine folks oh that's nice that's nice it's good yeah. it has a nice ring to it yeah, that's good yeah. that's way better than wise yeah uh, listen to steven sanchez's <laughs> music it's waiting for you all yeah. on amazon music final thoughts dan go see him on tour it's gonna be great it's gonna be so great um some of the some of the dates are selling out. So. Some of them are selling out. Maybe none of them will sell out. Well, no, some of maybe them. Maybe we'll yet. just <laughs> some of them already no have. <laughs> maybe we'll roll up. Maybe this is maybe it's time. Maybe it's time to go back <laughs> and just remember what it was like to have no one listen. <laughs> nah, you'll be just fine. <laughs> <I'm> just <kidding. laughs> the nursing homes are gonna empty out for the evening. It's gonna be it, pretty wild. That's gonna be awesome. Yeah, because they're gonna all die when they hear it. <laughs> Jesus. Don't wheel them out. They're all gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> That's not funny. That's horrible. That's actually horrible. There's a link in the description below if you want to buy some tickets. Yeah, please buy a ticket. We would love to see you. Um, yeah, it's great. You're a real one. Thank you. Yeah. You're a real one. It's, I like your shirt. I never got to tell you earlier. He smells really good also. I don't know if y'all ever have been told that, but he walked up earlier and introduced himself and just this of just like, wow. Nice smell. It was great. That was what is that? What's your smell? What's your fragrance? I don't, I don't know if I want to share it with the world. No, I'm kidding. It's matcha from Le Labo. That's so good. Yeah, oh, it's you. good. Le Labo. Yeah. yeah, they got some. Yeah, I, I rock a DS and Durga <laughs> every now and again. Do you know what that is? What the hell is that? DS and Durgas or DS and Durgas or something like that. Give it a Google. It's DS great. And they're so. They're so. Or I don't know if it's DS and Durgas or DS and Durga. It's I don't know what. It's great. I'll okay. give you a good smell when we take a photo after this. <laughs> oh, wow. It sounds like you're going to fart or something. <laughs> I'll give you a good smell to this. It's like, do you smell that? I had enchiladas for lunch, man. I'm like, yep, smell that. <laughs> so good. And he would do it. And he would do it. No, I'm just kidding. He wouldn't. He wouldn't. I'm lying. Imagine. Is that true, though? Are you going to? No. I'm just I just want to smell your, your cologne. That was DC and Durga. I can't like, even spell that word. DS and Durga. Oh, DS and Durga. Are you looking it up? I can't. I can't. Is it there? <laughs> Probably. I just don't know how to spell in Durga. Dur- D-U-R-G-A. D-U-R-G-A. Durga? 
DS, DS, D dot S. Oh, it's a store. It's a store. Oh, okay. And they have fragrances. Sick. Just like Le Labo. I just wear women's deodorant, so. Oh, nice. I'll go with it this later. <laughs> I will. Is it like uh, like the sport, like No, it's, blue? Like, it's like a, it has a very mellow smell. I don't like smells do you very wanna much. Do, do you want to share it with Can everybody? you share? We'll it's, put an Amazon link in the yeah, description. Can you, <laughs> can you show us, like, it's, how you do it? I just kind of, I put the shirt on first. Yeah. And then I lift it out, because if not, I always, like, whack myself. Oh. So then I just do a little bit of this. A little bit of that, and we're done. Just like one or two swipes. I don't do wow. much. Yeah, and I'm it's good. bang, right? Ban. There's no G on it. It's ban. ban. It's the green tube. I think I get shower fresh. Wow. I have to get it on Amazon. They don't sell it at Target anymore. That's, that's incredible. Don't tell my mom, but I have her Amazon account. I use her password and could. And that's I'm, amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. Wow, this is some good stuff. Wow. Thank you. I, I love this. <laughs> anyway, I think you're a superstar, so uh, Man, thanks I, for giving us your time and energy. I think you're a super smell. <laughs> <laughs> smell of goodness. <laughs> really nice. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, anyway, guys. Seriously, listen to his music. It's waiting for you on Amazon Music. Link below. Thanks. Steven Sanchez, everybody. Woo! Cheers, y'all. We did it.